Hello. Um, thank you for being here for um, this last plenary uh, lecture. Um, I've got my notes today. It's, of course, um, a great pleasure and a great honor to introduce our final plenary speaker, Professor Daniel Kahneman, or how many of us know him as Danny. It's not, however, an easy task, especially to this audience, um, because Danny, together with Amos Tversky, is unique, or they're both unique, in that um, there is hardly anyone in this room who has not read, being deeply influenced, if not inspired, by their work on judgment of, of uncertainty or on the psychology of choice. In fact, it's not clear how many of us would be here today if it was not for this work. And yet, this is not the only contribution of Danny to the field of psychology. Um, as I was asking colleagues last night, what else can I do? We, we, all, it's, we all know about Danny, about his work. Um, we all teach about his work. Is there something that I don't know? Well, I still learned something. There's something I knew, but I didn't know it was Danny who figured this out. So I'll share with you, maybe some of you know. But um, Danny started with work on um, attention and efforts, mental efforts. And maybe you know that uh, when you process something deeply, your pupil is dilating more. And uh, this is one of our, our first uh, contribution from Danny. And I've known that because other people have talked about this, but I didn't realize that even in this other community, um, they were also influenced uh, by his work. And so I imagine there are many communities, not just us, who would like to claim Danny Kahneman as one of their own. Um, and on behalf of the uh, EADM, of its member, and on every SPUDUM um, delegate today, um, Dania would like to welcome you back and hope that um, you will feel at home with us. Thank you. Well, it's a uh, <coughs> pleasure and an honor to be here. I haven't been attending this conference regularly. I, I have very clear memories of a, con of a meeting in Rome uh, where the Finetti was speaking. That just tells you if you needed to know how old I am, that's, <laughs> that was sort of localized. Well, <clears throat> 30 years is ample time for reflection, and it's been over 30 years. So I've been thinking about prospect theory, how it came about, uh, and what's happened since. And I find multiple ironies in this story. And it's largely these ironies that I plan to talk about. Now, it's not clear, I think, that pro prospect theory <coughs> has bifurcated. It is, in fact, now almost two theories. And it has been successful, I think, or fairly successful, in two quite different ways. Among decision theorists and measurement experts, people who study gambles, uh, who measure quality adjusted life years, uh, who read formal theory, um, who have Peter Walker's book on prospect theory on their shelf, uh, that is one prospect theory. It is largely an extension of cumulative prospect theory, and it's a formal theory, clearly in the spirit of expected utility theory, but different in the spirit of rank-dependent theories, but somewhat different. And that is one theory. And clearly, when Amos and I were working, we were working to begin that theory. But the world doesn't consist exclusively of students of gambles and decision-making. Among behavior economists, uh, J.D. Emmer's judgment and decision-making people study decisions and not choices among gambles. 
prospect theory exists there as well, but it has, I think, a completely different meaning. It doesn't exist as a theory. And it's, in a way, we really need a word to, to speak about those things. Prospect theory, as it is used by economists and by social psychologists and so on, it really refers to two or three concepts which have been completely detached from the original theory and live on their own. And those are concepts like reference points, loss aversion. Uh, I would say these concepts are used off warranty. The, you know, when there is no theoretical warranty when people use something, and off label, in, in the sense that physicians use a medicine for something it wasn't specifically prescribed for. At the same time, uh, I think it could be argued that this is the most important success of prospect theory or the most important effect it has had was that a few, very few concepts, I said reference point, loss aversion, framing, and to a lesser extent, I think, risk seeking and losses are notions that have become popular, detached from the theory, many people know about them, and they think they're applying prospect theory, which is, strictly speaking, they're not doing when they're using these concepts. Now, how this happened is part of my story. Now, as I've been thinking about prospect theory, I, a concept sort of irresistibly came to mind, which is coming to loom larger and larger in my thinking. And this concept is theory-induced blindness. That is, what do theories do to us that prevent us from seeing things. And this comes up in the story of prospect theory multiple times. I mean, it comes up, I think, in the blindness we had to overcome. It comes up in the blindness that we displayed, in the blindness we did not overcome. And I think, to some extent, it, it well, it shows up again in the blindness that prospect theory itself induces. Because I think that it is a property of any theory when it is adopted, when people use it as a tool, that it induces blindness. It prevents you from seeing things. Now, my favorite example of uh, theory-induced blindness, I should say, by the way, I'm not criticizing anybody. I mean, this, this I think, is a universal disease. It's, it's like the common cold. We all have it. I don't mean it as a criticism. Uh, I think we're all blind to a substantial extent. Now, my favorite example of blindness is a picture. And it's this picture. It's a picture of indifference curves. Now, you know, it has leisure on one axis, and it has income on the other <laughs> axis. And in one way or another, that picture has been in every textbook in economics for a century. Tens of millions of people have looked at it. Now, something is missing from it. And and for some reason, something very, very obvious is missing from that picture. And what's missing is the reference point. I mean, surely when we're talking of somebody who is employed, and that person has a level of leisure and a level of income, that theory doesn't display where the individual is. You just ask the question, where on this map? If the individual today, the theory hides it. It makes it very difficult to see. Now notice what is happening. By not displaying it, the theory makes it, assumes, in effect, and that represents the assumption, it's not important. You need not be concerned with it. All that matters are the final states of income and, and leisure and you are indifferent between states of income and leisure. Where you are doesn't seem to matter. Now, that's a pretty big thing, considering that we all know that it matters. That is, we all know about labor negotiations, that labor, labor negotiations are about concessions. And they're about concessions from a reference point. And the reference point is where you were. So all of us know that, and we don't expect labor negotiations to be about final states. We know they're about changes relative to the previous contract. And yet, this is the curve, it's dominant. 
I don't know how many people in the last century sort of wondered at that curve and asked, what on earth is going on? Why isn't the main thing that I see in the newspaper when I think about contract negotiations absent from this curve? So that's an example of theory-induced blindness. The theory itself blinds you to its flaws. That is, what, what is happening is you have respect for the theory. You assume that the people who formulated it and who accepted it, they know what they're doing. If they're not mentioning something, it's because it's not important or not that important or, or that you can get by without it. Uh, and this, by the way, illustrates one of the main, the insidious mistakes that theory, that are made in theories. Theories very often are mistaken by what they omit, not by what they say. It's by what they don't say. So you have this representation. It doesn't say anything about the reference point. That's its problem. But that is very difficult to see, the fact that something uh, just isn't there. Now, I will talk about theory blindness some and how and to what extent we managed to overcome it. First, let me introduce a hero of this. Whoops. What's going on? Oh, yeah. Many of you are familiar with that picture and with that person. That's Amos Tversky, with whom the work I'll be talking about was done. I introduced this picture. This picture was taken in, in the last years of Amos's life. You can see a very distinguished, very senior, thoughtful man. Now, that is Amos Tversky pretty much. I mean, it's a bit younger than, than he was when we did prospect theory. But that's roughly what he looked like. And, and that gives you an idea of the spirit in which good work is done. I mean, it's done by people who look like that. It's, <laughs> it's done by people who, uh, who are having a lot of fun. And, and Amos had an enormous amount of fun and induced me to have a lot of fun with him. And there were several things, several of his sayings that sort of inspired us and guided us. He had one thing that turned out to be very important to prospect theory. And that thing, let's get it right. And there was an infinite patience, especially because we were laughing all the time. When we were working, you know, when you're laughing, you're not bored. And we were never bored. Uh, and that was getting it right. And then Amos occasionally would say, let's go out and shake some trees. And, and this idea of shaking trees, of not accepting, not necessarily uh, taking for granted what's out there was really quite important. So I wanted to give you a sense of the spirit in which things were, were done. Amos introduced me to the study of decision making after we did our work on judgment. We started working on judgment in 1969. In 1974, we published a review in Science Magazine, and basically our work on judgment was done, except when we came back some years later, on Linda, which is a completely different story, uh, uh, we essentially didn't do very much on judgment thereafter, and we were wondering what to do. It was quite obvious we used to spend our, you know, our days together that we were going to do something else, and Amos said, well, let's do decision-making. So we did decision-making. And, uh, and Amos was a decision theorist. I wasn't. And that's a very important part of my story today, is the fact that he was a decision theorist, and I wasn't. My training was mainly in perception. That's what I knew. I knew psychophysics. I knew statistics. I'd been trained in mathematics. But I, I had no feeling for decision theory. Amos adored decision theory. For Amos, the von neumann morgenstern theory was an object of awe, and that's how he talked about it. And it was an object of awe when we attacked it. That is, when we were finding flaws in it as a descriptive theory, he never could fully overcome, and I think perhaps less than he should have done, the respect that he had for that theory as a mathematical theory. So he told me that decision, to study decision-making, you study choices between gambles. OK, so we study choices between gambles. He sent me to a book that he had authored with Clyde Coombs and Robin Dawes on mathematical psychology came out in the 60s. It's been out of print a long time. Very good book. 
so that I would study about things. And I learned that this, you know, the name of the game was to somehow solve Allais paradox. So Allais was the big thing, and if you understood Allais, you would understand uh, choices between gambles. Now, you know, I, I didn't question it at the time, because we all were using models in, in the work that we were doing, and so people were using, well, they were no longer using nonsense syllables, but they had used nonsense syllables for a long time, and we still remembered it. This is a truly ridiculous domain. And, and I think it is important to realize how ridiculous it is. I mean, who in his right mind would be interested in preferences between gambles with at most two zero outcomes, which is, you know, and with specified gains and losses and probabilities, which is the domain that Amos and I studied. But that, that is how it's done in science. That is, there is agreement on the rules of the game, on what you're supposed to do, on what is the object of study. You operate within a framework. You generally don't question that framework. We didn't. And you just do the, be the best you can within that, within that framework. Now, it seemed very important to solve Alain's problem for some reason. Now, the fact, interestingly enough, and that is something that I've understood only, uh, only this year, I think, and to a large extent in preparing the store, is that Amos and I had different utility theories in mind while we were working together on utility theory for several years. I basically had Bernoulli's theory in mind. You know, Bernoulli presented a psychological theory of how people choose between gambles and decide whether or not to, make, to take insurance, and that's, that was what I had in mind. Amos had the von neumann morgenstern theory in mind. He had axioms, he had rules of rationality. And we could, we never, I don't think that we ever articulated the extent to which uh, what was interesting to us differed, but it, it was quite profoundly. And I think that difference had a lot to do with the success of prospect theory, in that we were looking at utility theory in a way in two very different angles. Uh, one thing, that not being a great admirer of von Neumann and Morgenstern, because I came late to them, and the first thing I knew about them was that they were wrong, psychologically, so, you know, it wasn't, uh, that's how it began for me. So I was much less awed by them than, than Amos was, and I was less susceptible to, to theory-induced blindness when it came to, utility, to expected utility theory and to the axiomatic form, formulation of it. So we had complementary skills, and that was, I think, one of the keys to the quality of the work that we did there. Amos had a much better sense of the terrain and of how our thoughts related to the work of others. I had, I think, a pretty solid view of how all of this connected to perception, to psychophysics, and to the way that people see the world. Not that Amos didn't have it, but Amos was really very deeply influenced by uh, utility theory and by his role as a decision theorist, and you'll see how that played out. So part of my contribution was ignorance. Big contribution, turns out. And a sort of indifference to the formal theory. I could understand, I could follow it. I didn't have feeling for it. Now, uh, let me tell you how we got to what is undoubtedly the major contribution of prospect theory, which is the idea that people don't think in terms of final states. They think in terms of gains and losses. We got to this completely by accident, in a way. Uh, Amos had given me a chapter to read in his book, and I was doing my homework. So I read about, I lay in that chapter, and I read about an experiment in which some very distinguished people, including Patrick Soupies and Donald Davidson, some of the greatest minds of the 20th century, had tried to measure utility presenting people with gambles on pennies, literally on pennies. And all the gambles were formulated in terms of gains and losses, but all the conclusions were formulated in terms of the utility of money. And money clearly was wealth. And that was very puzzling to me. And it just didn't make sense. I mean, 
And the reason it didn't make sense was not a very profound reason. It was actually quite, quite superficial. It was that in the modern psychophysics, you don't do what Fechner did. Fechner is the one who sort of constructed psychophysical curves by asking people a different question. You measure JNDs, and through JNDs, you do the psychophysics of brightness. We were in the age of direct scaling. You want to know things, you ask people about whatever it is that you want to know. And in a sense, all these measurements of parameters of utility theory were done on a very old-fashioned psychophysical model. And that's what struck me. Now, I wasn't sure that, that there is anything deep in it, but I came and I asked Amos, what's, what's happening here? They're asking about gambles, and they, and they claim to be talking about wealth. I mean, this, is this OK? And I thought, you know, he might probably explain <coughs> to me how OK it was. But he didn't, actually. And you know, from that very day, we, we decided to use changes as the the medium over which the theory would be defined. Amos also knew about Markowitz, and he knew it had been done before, and, but it had been done quite in the way that, that we did it. Now, notice that everyone was blind to this issue. I mean, people would look at the expected utility for wealth, and people, very, very, very clever people, and just accept it. And that's when you stop to think of it, is pretty massive as, as blindness. Now, let me describe the major hurdle in the development of prospect theory and in the development of our thinking about prospect theory. And the more I think about it, the bigger of an obstacle this looks. Amos, having trained as a decision theorist, drew a very sharp distinction, which is you know, perfectly understandable, between two kinds of utility, risky utility and riskless utility. And ri the risky utility is inferred from gambles and from trade-offs between probability and amount. The riskless utility is inferred from trade-off between things. And it's very, very different in one of them is more likely to lead to consumer theory, and the other is more likely uh, to lead to the kinds of theories that von Neumann and Morgenstern had described. So for Amos, there were those two kinds of, theory, of values. Now, coming from psychophysics, I didn't understand it. And it took me a very long time until I really saw the point, and I, in some deep sense, I never saw the point. That is, for me, Value is just value. I mean, it's a psychological state. For Amos, having been brought up in the context of expected utility theory, of the deep, the axiomatic foundation, utility was a completely different thing. It was whatever you prove. It was whatever it is that you prove exists when you prove the existence of utilities from first principles. Now. When you are deeply committed to utility theory, you are deeply blind to a lot of things. And for example, and you see the world in ways that I think for a psychologist are very deeply misleading. Now, I didn't see this at the time. And, and what I'm describing today is sort of my conclusions quite recently about this. But when somebody begins to use phrases like, this is a risk-averse utility function because it's concave, then at least to me now, that person is deeply, deeply misguided. You know, something is wrong if you're thinking of risk-averse utility functions because you are using utilities exclusively in that crazy context in which you're inferring utilities from choices between gambles and in which all the attitudes to risk as it turns out, are embedded in the, value, in the utility function, in the shape of the utility function. This is an insane move for a psychologist. It makes absolutely no sense. We never saw that. We actually never saw through that problem. And uh, I mean, 
we came back to it repeatedly. Amos would explain it to me, and I would say, well, but you know, isn't there such a thing as, as a preference, as a value? And when you are in utility theory, among other things, you're a behaviorist. That is, you identify the concept with a method of measurement. And the method of measurement is either trade-offs between probabilities and gambles, or it's trade-off between things. And then you reach very different conclusions, depending on what it is that you're measuring. Uh, as a psychologist, it really makes no sense at all. Now, it, it must re remain consistent in that approach through the development of prospect theory. That is, for him, the value function of prospect theory was a risky value function. It was to be inferred from choices between risks. And for a psychologist like me, it never was. That is, it was, you know, whatever value is. Um, now, the fact that Amos was so committed to that conception of utility and value was absolutely essential to the success of prospect theory. If he had adopted my view of things, there would be no prospect theory. It would not have impressed people within the community. It would not have been accepted. And so the fact that he remains stubbornly wedded to his roots in what I now consider the nonsense of a lot of uh, the more formal work, and I don't mean that it's nonsensical in its own domain. It's nonsensical when you're trying to do what Amos and I were trying to do, which was basically psychology. As a, as a way of doing psychology, it's doing psychology with both hands tied behind your back. Now, I was never comfortable with it, and I remember uh, actually formulating a puzzle for Amos that we discussed a while, and which was very important later in the development of my own work. And the puzzle with this, I had the image of somebody who is getting a painful injection in the bottom every day for, for a while. He has a course of these injections. And they remain equally painful every day. So they don't change. And then the question I was asking was, how much would you pay to reduce the number of injections from 20 to 18 or from 10 to 8? Will you pay the same number? And it was absolutely obvious that people would not pay the same number from 20 to 18 or from 10 to 8. And that, to me, made it absolutely clear that we were not dealing with a real utility function. We were doing psychophysics on numbers. And going from 20 to 18 is less impressive than going from 6 to 4. And you pay, for, you pay more when it's more impressive. So that later, I, that there is a direct line from that to the work I did like 20 years later on experience utility because that were my f those were my first thoughts on experience utility as a criterion. And Amos agreed that, in a sense, it ought to be a criterion for decision making, but it was very hard to put together with his orientation, and, and he never did. And we never did, jointly. Now, the real success of prospect theory, and that's really ironic, not in the domain, not as a decision theory, but the real success of prospect theory, I would say in the real world, or in the world of behavioral economics, was when Dick Thaler applied prospect theory to riskless contexts. He took the value function, the loss of those value function, and he just applied it to explain uh, to explain some costs, to explain foregone gains, to explain the endowment effect. Now, Dick was even more of a psychologist than I was, and completely indifferent to theory. And so for him, it was obvious that there is one value function. It's risky. It's riskless. It has those characteristics. You are more sensitive to losses than to gains, and the rest follows. And Amos, interestingly enough, was for quite a while quite ambivalent to this. I mean, he could recognize Dick's brilliance immediately. There was no question. But, but it was a bit shocking to take you know, utility and to use it in such strange ways. Although 
I almost like everybody else, recognized that the product of, of doing that was pretty marvelous. Now, as I think about it, we had the best of all possible worlds. And in this sense, we were very, very lucky because prospect theory, as formulated, was formulated in, in Amos's spirit. It was a formal theory of decision making, and I think it deserved acceptance from the community to which it was addressed, and it got this acceptance. But what made th prospect theory significant was that its value could be completely, the value function could be detached from the context, could be detached from the risky context, and I, I would think that the major interesting applications of the value function of prospect theory have been in the riskless domain ever since, and ever since Thaler began. So that's just to give you a sense of how hard it is to overcome where you come from, how hard it is to see the picture. And, and the, there are many layers of irony here, because not only were we not aware that this was going on while it was going on, I think it's taken me the better part of 30 years to see it. That is, these are, not, these are recent thoughts. And you know, I have been thinking off and on about prospect theory for a long time, but I really came to this rather surprising view, to me at any rate, only recently. Now let me talk about some other examples of uh, theory-induced blindness. And, and I'll take Bernoulli's blindness, or uh, more, more importantly, the blindness of everybody since Bernoulli. Because Bernoulli started out by pointing out the blindness of those who would uh, measure the value of gambles or risky prospects by their expected value. And he said, you know, they're, they're just wrong. Uh, it doesn't explain risk conversion, which is obvious and exists. And it doesn't explain why the rich are more tolerant of risk than the poor. That is why the poor will buy insurance and the rich will willingly sell it to them. And so he developed a theory which explained this. And in Bernoulli's theory, at least as I re read it, it's ambiguous, but I think that at least as I read it, uh, his concept of utility is the generalized riskless concept that psychologists use to this day. But it certainly is not something that you would infer from a particular kind of measurement. Now, you know, we all know Bernoulli's solution, so outcomes are going to be valued by the utility of a state of wealth. And the expectation model that had been applied to expected value will be applied to utilities. And now the utility of a gamble is going to be a difference between, well, the utility of a gain is a difference between the utility of one state of wealth and, and the utility of another state of wealth. The utility of loss is also a difference. And by the way, you can see immediately that the utility of a gain and the utility of a loss are going to be exactly the same except for sign within a Bernoulli theory. There is only one way that this can work if the utility of a gain is defined as a difference. So, uh, look, this is wrong, and, it, and it's wrong in an obvious way. I mean, it's not, you know, obvious. It's obvious once you stop to think about it. So here, um, here is a choice, two million for sure, or equal chances to have one million or four million. Now, Bernoulli's theory, by implication and by silence, says something really important and completely wrong. It says that it doesn't matter what current wealth is when you're approaching that choice. So that an individual with half a million or an individual with five million, facing that choice, if they have the same utility function, will make the same choice. This is not true. If you stop to think of it, I mean, you know, if you have those two individuals, the world looks very, very different. The sure thing, that is, getting the sure thing, 
uh, two million for sure, is extremely attractive when you have 0.5 to begin with and distinctly unattractive when you start from five. And the kind, if you look at the magnitude of the losses that are involved in taking the gains, you will see that this in, is bound to induce risk, risk aversion in the one who starts from below and is very likely to induce risk seeking in the one who is making the choice from above. So that's a mistake. And it's a surprising mistake. It's a pretty big one. That is, that Bernoulli's theory entails that the starting point doesn't matter. You know, I, I don't think we ever saw that. Now, the, the striking thing is you have a theory that has, an, you know, that theory has legs. It was formulated in 1738, and it's still current. It, in some sense, it is still the dominant theory of how decisions are made. And it had that very strange mistake built right into it, the, the claim that, in a sense, is transparently false. Here's another if you, if you agree with me that Bernoulli's uh, utility is experience utility, so here are two individuals. Alan owns two million. Yesterday he owned three million. Betty owns one million. Yesterday she owned 0 0.5 million. Who has higher utility? Now, you know, in Bernoulli's term, it's the one that has the higher wealth. But that just doesn't work. If you think that Bernoulli's term utility, if he implied the pleasure or somehow the well-being that is associated with a given amount of wealth, then of course one of these people is miserable and one is elated, and the one that's elated is the one that is, current, is actually distinctly less wealthy. Now, then I think here is another, that's the final straw. Uh, a majority of people will reject an offer to play this gamble. Equal probability is to lose 20 or win 50. Actually, make it, no, uh, no, no, to win 25, equal probability is to lose 20 or win 25. This is almost universally rejected. Now, as Rabin showed, this is insane to try to explain this by the curvature of the utility function for wealth. It would have to be enormously curved in the small in order to account for that. Now, why did it take 300 years for somebody to come and say the obvious? And I had actually the, a personal experience in this case of, of how blindness works. Every year I would be invited to give a lecture in my colleague's class on finance, Bert Malkiel at Princeton. And, and he would invite me to give a lecture, and I would talk about you know, my kind of stuff. And, and I would say that utility is a sign you know, that there is real loss aversion and that utility is a sign to gain and losses. And Bert was never very impressed with me. You know, he was polite. He thought that was worth seeing. The year that I reported on Rabin's proof, now he was taking me seriously. Now, this really, why you need a mathematical proof of the obvious <laughs> is, is really remarkable, and it is, I think, part of the mechanism. It's part of the sociology that keeps us blind. Okay, so the puzzle really is uh, why, uh, why did it last so long? Now, the next thing that I'd like to talk about is Allais, the famous Allais paradox. This was Allais' problem. And it is reproduced, you know, it's in Wikipedia. That's where I found it last night when I wanted to make a slide. But, uh, but it's also reproduced in a lot of texts. I, I admire every text that does not reproduce it, that has a simpler version. This is looked at from the psychology. Let's look at Allais' problem. Looked at, you know, from the perspective of psychologists. It's a very poor problem. I mean, that's not. Basically, what is the intuition? And I'm not sure that Allais had it right. 
The intuition is that the response to probability is not linear. You know, it's supposed to be linear in the zero to one interval, including zero and one. This is for Neumann Morgenstern. If you have the intuition, no, it's not linear. The gap between zero and one percent is greater than the gap between 37 and 38. That's a lazy intuition. Is that the best way of showing it? I very much doubt it. I mean, it's fairly clear that the person who invented this problem was not clear about the psychology that he was going to demonstrate. Furthermore, I can tell you as a consumer of that problem, when Amos showed it to me, the number of wrong intuitions I had because of the millions of dollars, which are completely irrelevant, not a good problem. There is, by the way, a stronger version, I'm quite proud of that, that I invented this year. If you want to show a Lay's problem, here is how you really should show it, I think. I mean, this is one way. His problem one is 61% chance to win 5,250, or 63% chance to win 5,000. And here, I haven't done the experiment, but I will dare venture uh, that uh, people will take A over B. It has higher expected value. Problem two is 98% chance to win 5,250, or 100% chance to win 5,000. And here, preferences will flip. And now notice what happened. I added 37% to win to problem one, to both outcomes of problem one. And I added more to the version that was originally preferred. And now I don't like it. So this is stronger than than Alain's problem. But this is just a demonstration of what you'll get to if you're thinking, well, my task is to show that at the extremes, people are very sensitive between zero and one. And you know, I'm sure there are simpler ways of doing that. OK. Whoops, I didn't want to show the slides. OK. Now, Amos and I started working on prospect theory around 1974. And after about eight months, I think, there was a meeting near Jerusalem, a big meeting with lots of people, including Canaro, and uh, where theory of choice was discussed. And we had a paper for that meeting. It was called Value Theory. And there are a few examples of it still circulating. And I read it recently. That was 1975. We, we published in 1979. We submitted late in 1978. So we spent three, three years. And value theory had everything that matters in the broader sense to prospect theory. That is, it had everything that influenced behavior economists. It had the reference point, loss aversion, nonlinear decision weights, the isolation effect, every significant idea was there. But it was not quite right. That is, an alert graduate student would have found counterexamples. So we spent three years worrying about counterexamples. And that is sort of important. I mean, I'll give you an example of a counterexample. We asserted that decision weights for low probabilities are overweighted. But how about a prospect that do it with marbles, that has it's an urn with 100 marbles, and there are two winning marbles. The red marble wins $100, and the green marble wins $100, and the white marbles, the rest, win nothing. Prospect theory would commit us to the fact that the decision weight of one times two is greater than the decision weight of, of two marbles. Clearly had to be edited out. So we had editing as an operation to get rid of that. Now, we never felt that a minute of these three years were wasted. We accepted the rules of the game, you know, how to study risky choice. And, but there is one thing that I'd like to mention. We did not discover anything of any genuine interest during those extra three years. We made the theory defensible. We retarded by a lot the discovery of counterexamples. But uh, 
we didn't add anything in terms of content. And the reason is deep. The reason is because we were no longer studying anything that had to do with intuitions about decision making. We were studying choices between gambles. And that is very different. That is, you can study choices between gambles and learn about gambles. But what we had learned with loss aversion was something that could be taken out context, as it was by Dick Thaler and in the beginning of behavior economics. So the sociology of this is that there seems to be, you have to pass a test of competence. And what we spent those extra years doing, which was very worthwhile, was passing a test of competence so that we could have a publishable, serious theory of choice about gamble with at most two non-zero outcomes. Before our idea of loss aversion could be heard, we had to pass that test. Now, this you know, appears ridiculous, but it isn't. That is, I'm not cynical about this. Science is a conversation. And you have to compete for the right to be heard. And the competition has its rules. And the rules, oddly enough, are that you are tested on formal things. You're not tested on content, on the quality of the ideas. You're tested on the elegance of the formulation, on the consistency, and on your ability to take an, a domain, even a ridiculous domain, and account for it pretty much completely. Now, none of that matters to what Dick Thaler did with it, or what you know, is now being done with it in the context of policy, but it was essential. I had, a, I had a conversation, which in a way was disappointing to me, but uh, with the person who was the editor of Econometrica when Prospect Theory was published. And I asked him whether he still remembered his decision to publish the paper. And he said he remembered distinctly. And I was quite interested, so what decided you to publish the paper? And I was really hoping that he would say some of the ideas, you know, I really, you know, I was hoping he would say loss of vision. No. He said, I like the math. <laughs> uh, and this is important. It's not, uh... now the, the rules of the test require that you have a theory that has no counterexample. Or, at least, and that's a very important qualification, no counterexample that are found quickly. That is, if a referee finds counterexample, you are dead. If somebody finds a counterexample within the first two or three years, your theory will be wiped out. If the theory remains alive long enough for concepts to be detached from it, then the counterexamples no longer matter. That was true for Allais. Allais thought that he would show utility theorists that their, utility, that their theory was wrong, and they would grovel to the new king. It didn't happen. It didn't happen because they didn't care. But utility theory was very useful to economists. And they were not about to be deterred by the fact that you know, somebody had, as Ken Arrow told me, done a little experiment uh, that was not, uh, that was not matter. Now, Something very much like that happened to prospect theory. Uh, counter a genuine counterexample was found to prospect theory by Michael Birnbaum, who's been very insistent. And, and in some ways, what Mike has done is the same thing that Allais. His mistake is the same as Allais, I think. He thought that by showing that prospect theory was wrong, then it would go away. But he was late by 15 years. If he had been a referee to our paper, our paper would not have been published. Now, this is worth considering. Everything that's important about prospect theory that made it into behavior economics was in five problems. Or well, actually, less than five. It's a question about what is the value of A that makes a gamble acceptable? What's the loss aversion coefficient? What's your cash equivalent for winning or losing a certain amount? gives you the shape of the value function. What is your cash equivalent for a probability to P to win or lose $100? Gives you roughly the uh, decision weight function. That's it. Uh, I would add the questions about isolation, which show that the utility for wealth doesn't do it. 
We had all of this within six months. And now, why is it that we learn nothing in the next three years? Nothing useful. I have a theory about it. I think that the reason is that more complex gambles are format dependent in a critical way. That is, with those simple gambles, you can, you can fiddle with them. People will recognize what they are. And so the ideas that you get from these simple gambles will travel everywhere, including the riskless. When you start getting into multiple outcomes and things get very complicated, you're talking gambles. And, you're, and then in gambles, the format is crucial. So I will advance a really shocking <coughs> hypothesis. My hypothesis, actually, is that we may never learn more about decision-making from gambles than we already know. Because everything that could be learned was simple. And when it gets complicated, we're into formatting gambles. The best example, actually, I think, the best example is due to Mike Birnbaum. It says, uh, so, okay, here is the setup. Which urn would you choose? And it's done with marbles. I won't go into the details. This is the prospect theory formulation. There are two gambles. And prospect theory, the editing functions of prospect theory, tells you that you merge identical outcomes and obtain a simplified representation of the gamble that way. Now, Mike presents exactly the same gambles. He presents them like that. And now you work on rows rather than columns. And, and you notice that these two are identical. And you end up with a simplified representation that is completely different, depending on whether you were looking at a horizontal frame or, or at a vertical frame. Now, it is an, a counterexample to prospect theory, but what does it really show? It shows that both theories are wrong, and both theories are wrong in a completely uninteresting way. It shows that, uh, you know, your decisions about gambles of that level of complexity are not the same when you frame them vertically or you frame them horizontally. That's it. It's, in a way, it is very sad. But there's nothing to be learned here that, that is beyond those exercises. So if you are into gambles and you want to do gambles, it's vitally important. If you are into decision-making, there's nothing to be learned. Okay. I want to comp I want just to, um, well, I know I'm going on a bit long, but, but that's something I really do want to say. And, and it's about the, the blindness that prospect theory induces. And prospect theory is wrong. I mean, in, in the same obvious way that Bernoulli was wrong. You know, it's something you stare at that and you say, I mean, what on earth are these people thinking? What are, what are they smoking? Uh, the OK, so you have, we we'll look at three prospects. A one chance in a million to win a million dollars. A 90% chance to win $12. And a 10% chance to win zero. A 90% chance to win a million, and a 10% chance to win zero. What's wrong? Something is terribly wrong. The outcome of not winning is present in all three. According to prospect theory, it has the same value of zero in all three gambles. This is ridiculous. I mean, of course, you know, winning zero when you had 90% chance to win a million is a very bad outcome. So prospect theory ignores disappointment in the same way that Bernoulli's theory ignored other thing, and disappointment is real. Now, prospect theory, here is another one. 90% chance, you have a choice. 90% chance to win a million dollars, or you can get $75 for sure. Not hard. Now, 90% chance to win a million, or you can win $150,000 for sure. 
those two choices look very different because you know that there'll be no regret whatsoever if you put 75, you know, uh, if, if you forego $75, but if you forego $150,000 to get that gamble and you don't win, that is not a happy outcome. So the counter examples are there. Prospect theory makes them difficult to see. It induces blindness. It was to some extent, I think, a matter of luck that the corrections we had for Bernoulli's theory were productive. That is, they generated choice problems that people were interested in and that were different. Regret theories and disappointment theories, it's not that they're false. They're right. They do not make, and it's, to my mind, it's a matter of bad luck. They do not make equally sharp predictions about choices that people will want to remember. So they, they don't have you know, what it takes for people to invest in learning a new theory. OK. I hope I, I haven't sounded cynical, because I'm not at all cynical. I think that's the way it's got to be. But to look at the amount of blindness that there is in our enterprise, and, and at the sort of fortuitous events that can cause you know, the curtain to be lifted just a bit so that you can see past the blindness, I thought you know, that's a good story to tell, and I'm in a good position to tell it. Thank you. Thank you.